We worship this morning according to the abbreviated communion service on page 15 in the front of the hymnal. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our Old Testament lesson for today is from Proverbs chapter 3, beginning at verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. So far, the Old Testament lesson. Our psalm of the day, these words of Psalm 37, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. So far, the psalm of the day. And our epistle lesson from 1 Timothy chapter 6 begins at verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation, into trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. This way they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This is the word of the Lord. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The Holy Gospel is written in the 18th chapter according to St. Luke beginning at the 18th verse. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. 
Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad, because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with men is possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let us join in confessing our faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed as printed on page 18 in the front of the hymnal. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Our text in our continuing study of St. Luke's Gospel from this 18th chapter. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Luke tells us that this man is a ruler, doubtless in the synagogue. Matthew tells us he is a young man. Mark tells us he has great possessions. Hence, the title that we learned for this biblical account ever since our teachers taught it to us for the first time. It is the story of the rich young ruler. Now, here is a man who is wealthy and influential. He is a young man who has reached the top of the ladder early in life. He is the kind of man that you would expect would be well-respected and respectable. He did not earn his high level of living by larceny like the publicans, uh, nor uh, did he spend his inheritance that perhaps he had on hookers and booze like the prodigal son. No, he's a respectable man. Matthew draws our attention to the scene with the word behold, as in, now isn't this something remarkable? Mark tells us that the man ran down the road to meet Jesus, fell at his feet. Now what would compel this man running down this dusty road in a business suit, if you will, to fall down at Jesus' feet with this urgent question, not caring who knows or who hears or who sees. Just this and this only. The man has a question. I mean a real question. He comes to Jesus with something that is heavy on his heart and burdening his mind. He comes to Jesus with an honest to goodness question. This in itself is refreshing. He does not come to Jesus and ask about Retirement plans, weight loss, 12 steps to a perfectly organized life. He comes to Jesus with an honest to goodness question about heaven, the life hereafter, eternal life. Young as he is, he understands a man cannot stupidly, blindly, Keep living for today, for the here and now, for the next weekend and the next paycheck, that there are some things that are more important. He comes to Jesus with a question that determines everything else in life. I mean, how many people are there in this world? I mean, how many people are there in Bangor? who go through their allotted three score and ten, four score, seventy or eighty years of life and never ask the right question. Or, if they pose it, don't hang around long enough to hear Christ's answer. This man has a question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answers his question with another question. Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Jesus is really prodding him with this question. Why do you call me good? There's only one who is good, God. 
young, he's prodding him to think. If only God is absolutely good. And you're calling Jesus not just teacher or rabbi. He wants you and me to know there's something more about Jesus than that. If only Jesus is, or God is good in the absolute sense, then that means either Jesus is God himself, or Jesus is not good. Those are the two alternatives. Know who you're dealing with. And then Jesus says to him, because the man asked a law question, you know how, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You and I get this, we have been stewed since our youth on grace, right? It is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We are saved alone by the grace of God, through faith in him who loved us, lived and died and rose again for us. And so... The man asks the law question, what must I do? And Jesus gives him a law answer. Jesus says, you know, oh, the question's almost haunting. You know, you know and then recites in random order the second table of the law dealing with one's neighbor. Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness against your neighbor, honor your father and mother. And of course, the Bible does say, when it comes to the commandments, the man who does these things will live by them. If you can keep the commandments perfectly, ah, there's the rub. And you can almost hear the disappointment in the young man's voice. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. Frustrated. Perhaps shaking his head. Saying, Jesus, I didn't come here for a catechism lesson. This is all of the easy stuff. I learned all this stuff when I was a boy. There's got to be something a little more complicated, some secret method, some heroic deed. The Gospel of Mark adds a touching note that Jesus having looked at him, loved him. He loves the young man. Now, the young man is absolutely serious, but the young man is also absolutely deluded. He thinks he has really kept these commandments. For him, the keeping of the law floats on the surface. He does not see what St. Paul said in Romans, that the law is spiritual, that it is meant to be kept spiritually, perfectly, from the heart. That keeping the law simply doesn't mean that, well, it means not shooting people or not stealing the holy pleasures of the marriage bed before marriage or not robbing a quick trip. No, the, the lust and the hatred and the greed are the house guests from hell that live in every human heart. But Jesus looks on the young man and he loves him. The young man does not see that he hasn't kept the commandments. As a matter of fact, he is young. Maybe he hasn't lived long enough to humbly see just how bad he off he is and that all have sinned and fall short. You know what a, a young man may get with his head 
Oh yes, all have sinned, all have fallen short, we're all sinners. He may not get here. It is sometimes, not always, but sometimes, the left-handed grace of old age that sees how much we have failed and how much we need Christ. And that if we don't live by grace, we shall not live at all. It is this left-handed grace which the man needs to see that he doesn't quite get. And so Jesus says, you know the commandments. And he rattles them off. No, I need something else. The young man knows something is missing. There are dark corners in this young man's soul where he has not taken the candle of the Lord. Because if he had done so, he would not ask this question in the first place. Confident as he is that he has kept all the commandments, that he's okay with God, Jesus poses something else to him. Jesus heard this and said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. With one word, Jesus takes apart all of his help in himself. With one sentence, He exposes the fact that this man has not kept commandment number one. He has another God. He has a false God. This false God has been weighing him down and he has been dragging it along throughout his whole life. And Jesus now says, I want you to unload this thing that is burdening you. One thing. Sell everything you've got. Give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. You haven't even kept commandment number one. The man's reaction? Stunningly sad. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Slowly, sullenly, in one of the saddest scenes in the four Gospels, this man turns around and walks back down that road. Exceedingly, very sad because he had great wealth. Jesus, the divine physician, does not prescribe the same prescription for everyone. He does not ask everyone to offer up his son on a mountain. But he asked Abraham. He does not ask everyone to take a vow of poverty and go on welfare. But he did ask this man to give it all away. Jesus knows how to touch the one spot that might be the problem with us. What if Jesus were to talk to us about that one thing in our life? What would he ask us to give up? What would he ask us to walk away from? What would he ask us to Stop doing or start doing in order to have treasure in heaven. 
what would it be? Because you see, Jesus always comes to us at that point. He chooses to enter the one place that we have walled up with concrete. He chooses to talk to us about the one subject where we have pounded in a no trespassing sign. And only at that one point does Jesus wish to come in or he doesn't come in at all. And then Jesus goes on to say something that has stunned people for more than 20 centuries. Jesus looked at him and said how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And indeed it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked who then can be saved. Jesus replied, what is impossible with men is possible with God. What an impossible and laughable picture this is that Jesus paints. His supposed followers, laden down like a drove of camels, thinking to stampede through the eye of a dressmaker's needle. How silly! How impossible! And the disciples say that. The disciples who were not always known for catching on quickly, they caught this. Well, if that's the case, well then who then can be saved? They get it. They get it that it isn't just rich people Jesus is aiming at, it's any of us. A poor man can be just as fully hung up on wealth or on some other hang up in his life as a rich man. It's just that the poor man doesn't have any and he wants to get it and the rich man has it and he wants to keep it. But it's all the same problem. And Jesus says, with men, by human effort, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And so we learn once more, yeah, with God, not by my doing, not by anything I have done. Who then can be saved? Only by grace, not by anything that I have, not by anything that I do, but only by the doing and dying of Jesus Christ. It, with God, all things are possible. And then, Peter pipes up. Peter said to him, we have left all we had to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to him, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. We might think of Peter's question, well, you know, well, that rich guy, he walked away. We have left everything to follow you. What are we going to get? It sounds so mercenary. It's so tacky. What's in it for us? But Jesus does not rebuke him for the question. Jesus understands that we really want to know, is there treasure in heaven? Is the life to come something that will make up for all the things that we've gone through here for the sake of the faith? God here promises He will not turn the sacrifices of grateful hearts into the ashes of regret. Anything that we now have is nothing. Family, friends, wealth, all of it is nothing compared to what Christ Jesus will do for us. Not because we have earned it, not because we have deserved it, but because it is His good pleasure to make up to us thousandfold anything we have lost for His sake here on earth. The young man, he was young, he walked away, left, went down the road. Maybe he got older. Maybe eventually, 
The word of Jesus had time to work on his heart. And he came to see just how useless all this stuff was that let him down anyway. Did he ever think about it? Did he later come back to Christ? Throw it all at his feet for something far better. Jesus, priceless treasure. We're not told. How will the story end for you and me? Do you remember how the story started? I mean, look, the question was, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? You know, if this young man had only listened a little more carefully to his own question, inherit, who earns an inheritance? Who deserves an inheritance? An inheritance is something that was earned by the life and the labors of somebody else, and it's put into the hands of somebody who didn't work a single day for it. And before you can get that inheritance, someone has to die. Someone did. And because he did, you now know the answer to the question. Who then can be saved? Why? Even you. Even me. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us offer up our prayers today for Leland Kastenschmidt, who has now returned home from the hospital. O Lord, you are the great physician of soul and body. You chasten and you heal. 
We pray that you would look with mercy on your servant and restore his strength. You gave your son to bear our infirmities and sicknesses. Deal compassionately with him and bless the medical means employed on his behalf with your healing power. We commit him to your gracious mercy and protection. For you are a faithful and merciful God for Jesus' sake who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the communion portion of the service, beginning on the top of page 23 in the front of the hymn. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us pray. O God the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.